pulmonary hypertension. This discussion will begin by looking at the pathology of pulmonary hypertension. Secondly, we will discuss clinical features. Then we will go over the diagnostic steps followed by treatment options. And lastly, we will discuss the WHO classification of pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is defined by high pressure within the pulmonary arteries. Normal pulmonary artery pressure is about 25 over 10 millimeters of mercury with mean arterial pressure of 15. In pulmonary hypertension, the mean pulmonary artery pressure at rest is more than 25 during exercise more than 30 or the systolic pulmonary artery pressure at rest is going to be more than 40. The systolic pulmonary artery pressure is also called the estimated pulmonary artery pressure which is been looked at during an echocardiogram. Pulmonary hypertension has different etiologies. Hypoxia of the lung due to different etiologies can lead to vasoconstriction. In other places of the body, vasodilation is the response to hypoxia. However, hypoxia in the lung lead to vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction in the lung in the background of hypoxia leads the blood to better ventilated and perfused alveoli. The lung vasculature is a low pressure system. This chronic insult of the lung vasculature can lead to the hyperplasia of the smooth muscles. So this narrows the lumen and it increases the pressure within the pulmonary vasculature. Patients may present with exertional symptoms. So they can have shortness of breath, chest pain, syncope, and also due to the backflow, there can be edema, peripheral edema. Patient can also have non-specific symptoms such as fatigue. Patients can also present with other disease specific symptoms. So they are dependent on the etiology of the other disease, which we will discuss WHO classification. On physical examination, there can be right ventricular heave due to right ventricular hypertrophy. And the jugular venous pressures can be elevated with distended neck veins. On jugular venous waveforms, there can be increased A wave and also giant V waves. A wave is produced by atrial systole and this is increased due to right ventricular hypertrophy in pulmonary hypertension. V wave on jugular venous waveform is due to the filling of the right atrium and the tricuspid regurgitation secondary to pulmonary pressures can create a giant V wave. So the normal JVP pressures look something like this with the A, C wave, the X descent, V wave and the Y descent. So this is A, C, X descent, Y descent and this is the V. So the A waves will be increased with giant V. So it will look something like a giant A with the X descent and a giant V. So the A and V will be increased. A loud P2 can be heard with narrow splitting on auscultation. There can be right-sided S4 due to the right ventricular hypertrophy. If there is right ventricular failure, we might be able to hear a S3, right-sided S3 on auscultation. Initial diagnostic test is the chest X-ray. The chest X-ray will show the enlargement of the pulmonary arteries. And this can be with tapering or pruning of the distal vessels. The lung fields are loosened with right heart enlargement. EKG can show right ventricular hypertrophy and also the right atrial enlargement. Right ventricular hypertrophy presents with the right axis deviation. So in that there can be R to S ratio more than 1 in V1. R in V1 is going to be more than 6 millimeters and S in V5 is more than 10 millimeters. And there can also be right ventricular strain pattern. 
right ventricular strain pattern means ST depression and T wave inversion which can be seen on V1 and V2. Right atrial enlargement is present with P pulmonale. So in P pulmonale, the P wave is going to be more than 2.5 millimeters in 2, 3 or AVF. The echocardiogram is a very important test because it is going to show the increased pulmonary artery pressures and this is also known as the estimated pulmonary artery pressures. The next step would be to perform the right heart catheterization. During the right heart catheterization, we can perform this vascular reactivity using inhaled nitric oxide or IV epoprostenol or IV adenosine. This helps to test the vascular reactivity. A positive vascular reactivity testing means when the mean pulmonary artery pressure falls at least by 10 millimeters of mercury to less than 40 millimeters of mercury without compromising the cardiac function. So the cardiac output should be either unchanged or it could be increased but it should not compromise its activity. This step is very important because sometimes we need to test the vascular reactivity to determine treatment options. If there is positive vascular reactivity, we can give calcium channel blockers as a treatment option. Another diagnostic testing is the pulmonary function tests. This helps to look for any underlying lung diseases. We can perform CT and GEO to look at the parenchyma and to rule out any PE. VQ scan can be helpful to rule out thromboembolic diseases. We can also do serology testing to look for any other causes. So we can do serologies of ANA, rheumatoid factor, SSA, SSB, HIV. These are helpful to look for other etiologies of pulmonary hypertension. Treatment for pulmonary hypertension is disease specific. However, all the patients can benefit from oxygen therapy exercise and maybe from anticoagulation depending on the etiology. Pulmonary hypertension specific agents can be used to control the pulmonary arterial hypertension and these include phosphodiesterase inhibitors, endothelin receptor antagonists, cyclic GMP enhancers and also calcium channel blockers. However, initially the patient's should be referred to a specialized centers because the treatment can even be harmful. So we need to determine if the patients actually need the treatment for pulmonary hypertension, which should be done in specialized centers. So the calcium channel blockers can be used in a very low percentage of patients. However, the patients should have a positive vascular reactivity. This is only seen in a very low percentage of patients. Another treatment modality is the phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as sildenafil. Sildenafil was, they were initially created to treat pulmonary hypertension. We can also use prostacycline analogs such as ipoprostenol and these dilate the pulmonary arteries. They are given IV. However, we have first oral prostacycline agonist called Celexipac. Endothelin inhibitors can also be used and they have the suffix tan in them. Examples are bosentan, ambristan, mesitentan. They help to prevent the growth of the pulmonary vasculature. Prevent pulmonary vasculature growth. Another treatment is the cyclic GMP stimulate. These increase the nitric oxide and an example is Riosiguat. Now let's look at the WHO classification of pulmonary hypertension. This is classified into five categories. The first category is the pulmonary arterial hypertension. 
the second is the pulmonary hypertension due to the left heart disease third category is lung disease and o hypoxia so it has to do with the lungs fourth category is the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension lastly we have the miscellaneous group where we can put all the other causes under pulmonary arterial hypertension we have idiopathic and we also have collagen vascular diseases so this can include sle rheumatoid arthritis scleroderma congenital heart disease can also lead to pulmonary hypertension portopulmonary causes can also lead to the pulmonary hypertension due to pathologies in the liver other etiologies can include hiv and some other medications the second category is the left ventricular chf and also left sided valvular diseases so this can include the aortic stenosis or mitral stenosis lung diseases of obstructive or restrictive pathologies can lead to pulmonary hypertension hypoxia can be caused due to high altitude obstructive sleep apnea or even obesity chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension which is the fourth category can be caused by a chronic thrombus chronic thrombus can grow to be large and lead to pulmonary hypertension in the long term some slow growing tumors can lead to pulmonary hypertension and maybe any foreign bodies or in situ thrombosis the fifth category is the miscellaneous category which can be due to either hematologic causes such as sickle cell disease or chronic hemolysis systemic diseases such as sarcoidosis can also lead to pulmonary hypertension any other pathologies that we cannot specifically put into a category can be put to the fifth category to summarize the lecture pulmonary hypertension is occurring due to chronic vasoconstriction as a result of hypoxia leading to narrowing of the lumen patients present with exertional symptoms so these can be shortness of breath chest pain or any other disease specific symptoms right heart catheterization is a very important step in pulmonary hypertension it helps to look for vascular reactivity and which can determine treatment options who has classified pulmonary hypertension into five categories depending on different pathologies all patients benefit from oxygen therapy exercise and maybe from anticoagulation depending on the pathology that's pulmonary hypertension